Oh my gosh. The feds are full of cases. Okay. Now, first and foremost, we are going to look at the United States Supreme Court's decision for affirmative action last summer. Okay. Now, we're going to look at this for a few different reasons. One, does anybody here do business with the government or anything and you have affirmative action plans? Anybody? Okay, I've got a few. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a look at th this case for that reason. Is anybody here public sector? Okay, yeah, I'm getting some more thumbs up here. Okay, so there's a lot of reasons to look at this case. But let me cut to the chase. For you private sector employers out there, this case has brought the hammer down. And I mean brought the hammer down big time. Um, companies are falling like flies. And they're dropping their diversity programs like crazy. All right? And, uh, and it was really interesting. I, I sat in on uh, a chapter's Oh, dear God in heaven, DEI program earlier this week. Oh, my God. I, the idiocy of what I'm hearing is amazing to me. They had a luncheon speaker who got up and actually said that people are dropping their DEI programs because they do not understand DEI, including the United States Supreme Court. Okay, well, that's certainly an opinion. It's a stupid opinion, but it's an opinion. You got to be freaking kidding me. Really? Really? Do you actually think the Supreme Court doesn't understand what they decided on? Are you kidding me? Now, maybe you disagree. Okay, that's fair. But I will tell you, and understand, I just want to clear up here, uh, particularly since J.D. Vance, um, United States Senator from Ohio, said that if he thought a ruling from the United States Supreme Court was illegal, he wouldn't follow it. No, no. Let me, let me just clear up here. Why, why are the Supreme Court decisions so important, like on harassment and this one on affirmative action? <sighs> okay. The United States Supreme Court is the law. Everybody with me? They are the law. They are. They say, well, we're going to interpret the law. Whatever they say is the law. And that's it. That's it. They're, they're, until you can appeal to God, there is nobody to go to. So I'm telling you right now, this is the law of the land. And if you don't like it, Tough noogies. Tough. Tough. Unless it says U.S. Supreme Court justice in front of your name, nobody really cares what you think. Okay, so you see the type of programming you're getting on this topic? Okay, I just heard a speaker, the luncheon speaker, stand up and say that, okay, United States Supreme Court doesn't understand the you know, I'm going to show you why this decision was decided the way it was and I will tell you point blank the United States Supreme Court looked at some data that was very very convincing that Harvard's affirmative action program was severely racist severely not even close okay so let's look and see what we're looking at here okay now this all came about from Asians you know usually you get oh well you know a bunch of white guys or white people are upset no no these were Asians who filed this lawsuit, and they formed the Students for Fair Admissions. And basically what's happening is these folks are applying to positions at Harvard. Now, let me just give you the ratio for Harvard. They get about 40,000 submissions to their undergraduate program every year. Okay. They take 2,000. That's pretty steep. That's pretty steep. Okay. So... What the Asians are saying is that this entire process of giving a little bit of help to someone who is black 
is racist. That is racist. And what they're saying is this is ill, this is unconstitutional under uh, the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. Okay, everybody with me? They originally were arguing Title VII, but we'll talk about Title VII later, but changed it to equal protection. Now, here's what they're doing. The And again, everything is data-driven. And you might not like it, and that's fine. That's perfectly fine. In the lawsuit, the plaintiffs, which are the Asians, gained access to Harvard's individualized admission files. Okay, so from 2014 to 2019, they looked at all these admission files. And then they looked at some aggregate sample data, you know, conclusory data from 2000 to 2019. The plaintiffs also interviewed and deposed numerous Harvard officials. From these sources, the plaintiffs allege that Harvard admissions officers consistently rated Asian American applicants as a group lower than others on positive personality traits, such as likability, courage, and kindness. Now, freeze right there. To get into Harvard, you got to have good grades. You have to have a lot of extracurricular activities. You have to have good scores on like ACT or ACT. That's very much more objective. Your personality, does that sound rather subjective? I am hearing a lot of subconscious bias coming in. A lot of subconscious bias, okay? Interestingly enough, the admissions officers within Harvard, they never met the applicants. The Harvard alumni did. Now, I want you to think of the stereotypes between maybe um, uh, Blacks and Asians, okay? Because think about this. They claim that the alumni interviewers gave them personal ratings that are much higher. Okay, think about this. Anybody here, can you remember a war that we've been in with where the opposing side to the United States was Asian? Can anybody remember when we fought some Asians? Well, it's kind of hard not to think. I mean, Korea, uh, Vietnam. How many people grew up during Vietnam? Oh, yeah. I mean, I missed the draft by like two years. Okay. So um, let me tell you, do you think that we have some subconscious biases about Asians being cold, subhuman, mean, devious, uh, and then compare to maybe some of the images we have of Black Americans, like uh, good times? The Jeffersons, okay, Sanford and Son, or some of these people that we particularly know. There are a lot more African Americans in the United States than Asians. So chances are really good that we know some people who are black that we like. So guess what? The Asians were consistently ranked lower as not being personable. Okay, that was a factor to get into Harvard. But when they met with the Asian Americans, that bias did not tend to come out as much. But remember, no one on the staff at Harvard is meeting with the Asian Americans. So let's look at the data. Um, they had a, a Duke University uh, economist and he testified for the plaint uh, plaintiffs, that's for the Asians. He said that Asian American applicants as a group perform stronger on measures of academic achievement, like SAT, ACT, and extracurricular activities. Now, hear what I'm saying. They scored as a group higher on these quantitative scores, all right? Now, here's the kicker. And understand, this is what Harvard could not refute. If they could have refuted this, you might have had a different, a different result. If an Asian American applicant who met the minimum criteria, like their test scores from high school, I mean their, their test scores, ACT and everything like this, their GPA from high school and extracurricular activities, 
those Asians had a 25% statistical likelihood of getting into Harvard. But if you had those same scores and you were white, you had a 36% chance of getting into Harvard. Okay, does that sound like a lot, 11% across 40,000 kids? That is significant, but it gets better. If you're Hispanic and or black uh, applying to Harvard, respectively, Hispanic kids would have a 77% chance of getting into Harvard. The black applicant had a 95% chance of getting in. Okay, now freeze right here. The Asian Americans are scoring higher in GPAs, test scores, extracurricular activities, and look at 70% more likelihood with those same scores that you would get in if you were black. Why? The personality assessments. Because now, please pick up on the sarcasm because I don't want to get hate mail. Because you know, black people are nice. I like it along with black, but you know what Asians are, they're mean. You know what those Chinese are like? Well, you know what those Vietnamese are? Okay, you feel the, the, the racism coming out here? And understand, yeah, racism against someone who is black is just as bad as racism against somebody who is Asian, against someone who is white. We shouldn't be doing that. Okay, now I'll tell you right there, that page right there is telling you a lot. Now let's go back. Oh my God in heaven, to this uh, diversity full day program that the luncheon speaker said. This luncheon speaker never read this case. I will bet everybody here lunch and something more than pizza. Okay, maybe a Dairy Queen chaser. I will bet you all this person is out there giving this information, never read the case. And I'll tell you, if you really want to know how the law works, what you got to do is you got to print this thing and you got to read it twice. And I'll tell you, when I get into this, I got 200 hours tied up in doing legal update every year. Every year, because I got to read the case. Then what do I got to do? I got to go back and read it again and destroy it. Rip it to pieces. Highlight it. Mark it. Don't open your mouth if you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, now right there, can you see why? Now, let me just also clue you in here. You know that six states have already canceled and defunded uh, or and or prohibited DEI programs in their state? Six. The seventh one is Nebraska and they're talking about that right now. This is a big reason why. It is not okay to turn around and give favor to one minority over another. This, the United States Supreme Court says, absolutely positively violates the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Supreme Court, or of the U.S. Constitution. What's that mean? It means equal protection. That's what it means, okay? Harvard's admission staff testified that they did not believe that different racial groups had better personal qualities than others. But nonetheless, Asian applicants as a group consistently received weaker personal scores over that same period, and Harvard's admissions office rated Asian Americans with the worst personal qualities of any racial group. Now, if you've lived in America for any period of time, can you see why that would be? Can you see why that would be? Oh. The report also alleged that Harvard's preferential treatment of African-American and Hispanic applicants is not the result of the university's efforts to achieve socioeconomic diversity. No, okay? Harvard admits more than twice as many non-disadvantaged African-American applicants than disadvantaged. What's that mean? They're rich. <laughs> They're rich as anybody. <laughs> Look to see what you're going to spend just in tuition at Harvard. Let me clue you in. Selling a kidney won't do it. It's going to take two kidneys, at least. I mean, you're looking at 80 some thousand dollars a year 
And then you got room and board. Has anybody ever tried to rent an apartment in Cambridge? Oh my God. Okay, so you kind of see, you don't understand DEI. No, you need to read this case. Now, fear's right there. Can you see why the wrath of the legal system is coming down on diversity? This type of data. And I can tell you, you might not like this data, and I give you that right, absolutely. But you've got to deal with it. Plaintiffs also claim that Harvard's own Office of Institutional Research found a statistically significant penalty against Asian American applicants in an internal investigation in 2013 and then kept them private. Never did anything about them. See some devious going on here? Now, freeze right there. Let's say we did that to help white students to stick it to Asians and Hispanics and Blacks, and we did this to help whites, what would the outcry be? Oh my gosh, you would hear gnashing of teeth and you know, the pitchforks would be, it's all wrong. Okay, now here we go. The Justice Roberts, he wrote the majority opinion. He stated that the use of race was not a compelling interest. Okay, it's not compelling. Why? Because you got all these other disparities. And the means by which the students attempted to achieve, the schools attempted to achieve racial diversity, which was by tracking bare racial statistics, had little or no relationship to the purported goals, which is to achieve diverse viewpoints, intellectual diversity, and developing a diverse future. You know, boil down to, do I like you? Do I like you? And all the subconscious biases that go with that. Okay, it was noted that this prohibition on the use of race in deciding who was to be accepted did not stop universities from considering a student's discussion of how their race has impacted their life, so long as the discussion is concretely tied to quality of character or unique ability to that particular applicant to contribute to the university. Tell me what you've overcome to get here. Oh, and everybody's got a story like that, right? Or most people. Okay. Now, Roberts is writing that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment applies without regard to any difference of race, color, or nationality, and thus applies to everybody, such as eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. Okay, so I'll tell you right now, this is a concrete opinion and affirmative action programs at universities are dead, are dead. Now, for you public sector folks, guess what? The 14th Amendment applies to you. Private sector folks, it doesn't apply to you. Because the 14th Amendment says the government, actually the whole Constitution says, the government shall not infringe your right of free speech, shall not you know, uh, hinder your right to bear arms, all those kinds of things, okay? Here, uh, this is gonna apply to all you public sector folks out there. So affirmative action, for the most part, is dead. Okay, and he said affirmative action plans lack sufficiently focused and measurable objectives warranting the use of race. Unavoidably employ race in a negative manner involves racial stereotyping and a lack of meaningful endpoints. Okay, now freeze right there. That language right there, I underlined it, you are gonna see that in lawsuits against private sector employers. It's still a United States Supreme Court decision and uh, using race will involve racial stereotyping. Now you see where the law firms now are lining up and they're saying there's no such thing as a legal diversity program in this country. Okay, how many people in here you have seen firsthand where somebody in an organization wants to hire someone, give the edge to them because of their minority status? I tell you right now, that's happened to me dozens of times. I was dumb enough to go into HR. That's how dumb I was, go into human resources. Do you see as many men in HR as you do women? I will tell you right now, I've lost out on a lot of contracts. I have clients that tell me, oh, we can't have you in to train because we need somebody black. Oh, have you ever had this one? Where, oh, come on, I got this guy, he's not doing his job. Um, uh, can I just fire him? I don't want to go through all this warning stuff. Come on, he's a white guy. Can I just fire him? Illegal. 
illegal. Okay, now here's a kicker. Neil Gorsuch, in his concurring opinion, suggests that the court's decision in this case will inevitably influence how private employers structure their DEI practices. What's he saying? Give us another case in the private sector. I'll tell you, if you have DEI initiatives at your workplace, revisit them. Revisit them. Okay, so this case directly applies to um, public sector employers everywhere. Does everybody understand how that works? Equal protection. So these programs are dead. Now, Title Seven. Title Seven. Now let me give you. Now everybody here understands. You're not allowed to discriminate on these protected classes, right? That's very simple. What's that mean? You cannot use these protected classes to make employment law decisions or employment decisions. Let me say that again. You cannot use these factors to make any decisions. Here's Mark Cuban who is in a buttload of trouble. And he came out a week or so ago I only ever hire the person that will put my business in the best position to succeed. And yes, race and gender can be part of that equation. I view diversity as a competitive advantage. Is anybody hearing something illegal in there? Well, the commissioner of the EEOC did. Now I'm telling you, you public, you private sector folks, listen up. Okay, this has always been illegal. But I will tell you, I've been on the phone with the EEOC for the last couple of weeks. They're going to get you. They are going to get you. This is right from the commissioner. And look at this language. Unfortunately, you're dead wrong on black letter Title VII law. Now, Freeze, is there any misinterpreting that? Is she not clear? <laughs> okay. Um, and if he, Cuban is using it, race or gender, as a factor, and even if it is not the only factor or the dispositive factor, if it is any part of the decision, then it's a motivating factor and that's illegal. What's that mean? They're gonna get you. They're gonna get, and I will tell you point blank, I have been sitting in more rooms where someone says we need to increase our diversity. Okay. That means that you set a wider net. That's what that means. You build up the applicant pool. It is illegal to give any advantage to someone for any protected class in giving them a hiring decision. Now, just not just hiring decision, promotions. Now, look what I've heard in just the last month. In just the last month from diversity programming. Companies need to establish a mentoring program for black employees. You need to form mentorships to help Latino women. Illegal. Illegal. Now, why am I going now? I want you public sector folks to understand where you are with this, but I want you private sector folks, when you hear these discussions going on, the answer should be no. Now, freeze right there. How would someone ever prove this case? that you gave preference to someone because of their minority status. How would they prove it? How many people here use email? I use email a couple hundred times a day, I use email. Anybody here use texts? Anybody talk to each other? Okay, freeze right there. How many people here are willing to perjure yourself for your employer? I'm going to give you my, uh, oh, no, <laughs> oh, boy, I tell you, I don't know about you, but I have delicate features. Um, I would not fare well in prison, okay, and they're not going to send me to one of those big white collar golf course prisons, okay, I'm going to be in Attica, okay, so I, I your phones, let me tell you, all you HR people know. You've, we've got to start treating people in similarly situated situations the same. And I'm going to show you where a company got waxed.
because it enforced their rules against a white guy and not a black guy. No, I'll tell you, this has put the light on it. Shouldn't we have mentoring programs for everybody? Everybody who wants them. Oh, that would get me booed at a diversity conference. And now you're starting to see why you can count on one or two hands the number of straight white males at diversity conferences. Oh, my own chapter told me that I'm guilty because I'm white. I'll tell you, that is ridiculous. Now, uh, 13 attorney generals have sent out letters to Fortune 500 companies threatening imminent and se serious legal consequences. They're coming after you. Okay. And this is the guy that run, is with America's First Legal. This is the guy that says there's no such thing as a DEI program that's legal. They're all illegal. Now they're all, you see how the Harvard case has gotten everybody fired up. And it is, it, you're seeing DEI under attack like never before. So what's that mean? It means don't engage in these illegal programs. All right. And more of the same thing. This is actually Edward Bloom. He was on the winning side of the Harvard case. And he says, hey, I am coming after more organizations. We call it reverse discrimination, but it's just regular good old fashioned discrimination. Okay, makes sense. Ooh, it's in there a couple of times. Okay, so, and if you are serving on a board someplace, do you know that you have legal liability? You, if you go out there and teach illegal tactics, someone who uses that and gets burned can sue the organization, can sue the board members and can sue all the companies these board members represent. I mean, it's just, it's really getting bad out there. Everybody with me? Okay, now real quick, illegal quotas is different from uh, affirmative action. Affirmative action says, we're going to give you a little bit of health. We're gonna give you just a little bit, no. Affirmative action is dead, it's illegal. An illegal quota came from the University of Michigan where they gave 20% more points out of 100 to someone who was black. So if you were gonna go uh, to the University of Michigan and you were white, you started at zero. If you were black, you started at 20 points. Now, does that sound like a big advantage? Absolutely, that's what the United States Supreme Court said. Setting a numerical number like that, 15%, 20%, is a substantial difference, and that's illegal. That's been illegal since 2003, over 20 years. Okay, don't do that. Even Sherm comes out and says, no, these are illegal. Don't do that. And honestly, what are your people going to think? This is a great quote from Sherm. Aren't your people going to think, gosh, I'm really, really qualified for this job, but I've been told I'm going to get, I'm not going to get it because the company has an arbitrary number that puts me on the outside looking in. Isn't that going to cost you people? Okay, now, here's where I'm bringing this up. Has anybody ever worked someplace where we're going to set a goal to hire 10% more minorities? We're going to hire 10, 15, 20% more. That is a quota. It is illegal. And I will tell you, I'm sitting in with some of my clients. They have the best of intentions. No, it's illegal. You will get caught from your emails, your texts, and people will testify against you. Actually, it's kind of funny. When I go in, a lot of times the companies don't want to tell me what they're doing. I'm the only one in the room who can't testify against you. I'm your attorney. Oh, your HR person. Oh, yeah, if they got any brains, they'll turn on you in a minute. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, so, no. What do you want to do? You want to make sure you are increasing the applicant pool. It is perfectly signed. We are going to increase our applicant pool by 15%. Applicant pool. Because then we'll find the best person. Even Sherm recommends that. Okay, this is an article that Sherm put out. I gave you the link here. Do not set quotas. Do not set goals of numeric value. You should always try to hire the best person. And how do you do that? 
increase the diversity of the entire candidate pool. And let me tell you, I come from a little town called, well, city, but kind of a town, Newark, Ohio. Newark, Ohio. Great company over there called First Federal. 54 employees in little Newark, Ohio. Extremely diverse. Why? They do it right. They broaden their applicant pool as much as they can. And they have people working there who are black, Asian, transgender, gay, all across the board. They have great diversity for a little 54 employee company. Why? Because they absolutely boost the diversity of the applicant pool. And unfortunately, yes, that means work. That means work. I'll tell you, take her advice. Diana Scott, the capital human capital center leader for the conference board, they're a great place that predicts the future to know about these people. What is she saying? Steer clear of anything that smacks of a quota. Don't go near it. Don't go. And understand, we're here to prevent lawsuits, right? Not to win them. Not to win them. We're here to prevent them. You don't go near anything that has the smacks of a quota. Or I'll tell you, Ten to $100,000 in attorney's fees, even if you win, you still lost. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. And the reason being is this issue is heating up. The lawsuits are started. I've had, well, actually, I've had two clients with civil rights charges filed against them. And I looked at the data that they had. And I'm like, man, we should have been talking about this last year. Well, what do we do? You settle it. You settle this case. You settle it. Because honestly, if you win, you're still going to spend $100,000 and you're not going to win. You did it. You gave preferential treatment to this job assignment to someone because they're black, because they're Hispanic. No. Or you treated this white guy worse. No, it's illegal. Okay, so the whole world is changing and this is why Sherm is saying we got to get away from diversity and into inclusion. And this is what I'm telling you for legal update. Don't go near these third rails. And you wish it's only a lawsuit. How do you want to be viewed on social media as being a racist against whites, Asians? Make sense? Okay, let's take a breath because this is a lot of stuff. Because I tell you, our hiring, we get into a lot of this stuff. And I have audited a lot of different companies and looked at their diversity practices. I've always found them to be illegal. I have never seen a diversity program that was legal, never. And the chances you'll get caught today, really, really, really good, really good. Okay, so questions, comments, deep religious concerns over anything we talked about. 